Okay, guys, we're going to get started. Now, the schedule lies. I'm actually going to talk about major and design before I talk about CQRS. How many people here have read the book, The Major and Design? Okay, keep your hands up. How many people read past chapter seven? Why are the hands going down? <laughs> So I'm not going to talk about domain-driven design the way most people talk about domain-driven design. How many of you have been to a presentation on domain-driven design? How long did they spend talking about entities and value objects? I'm not going to talk about entities and value objects. In fact, I'm only going to talk today about bounded contexts. Bounded contexts are something that you can use from domain-driven design, whether you use domain-driven design or not. They're a very valuable concept. Now, how many people read chapter 11? There's so few hands. It's, I actually think what happens is people read the book, and it starts talking about entities and value objects, and it gets repetitive. And they think that's all there's going to be for the rest of the book. So they stop reading. My big problem I have with the book, and I've talked to Eric about this, chapter 11 to the end of the book should have been at the beginning of the book. The whole concept of context is that it gets really, really confused in domain-driven design. And domain-driven design makes no sense if you don't understand a context. Now, there's lots of examples of context in everyday language. As an example, I speak French. I learned French in Quebec. If we were to look at the French that I learned, it's very different than the French in France. Déjeuner, does anyone know what that means? It means breakfast in Quebec. It means lunch in France. There's loads of examples like this in language. They exist because people have specialized themselves. They have a boundary between them and the language diverges. The same thing happens in organizations. Now the best way to go through this is actually to go through an example. And the example I like to use is from an insurance company. Does anybody work in insurance? I'm going to apologize now. It's a very naive model I'm going to show. But it's a model that everybody can understand. So what we're going to end up with is we're going to end up with the concept of a policy. Oddly, an insurance company has policies. So we're going to go around and we're going to start talking to some domain experts. And the first thing they tell us when we're talking to sales is that they look at policy as being an endpoint of their process. They sell a policy. When they complete selling, they end up with a policy. And it has some commissions associated with it. It also has a salesperson. Now we continue talking around to the rest of the organization. And they tell us that a policy, in terms of claims, has some claims automation rules. In this particular company, they have an automated claims process. When you go to the internet, 90% of their claims never actually talk to a person. That'd be pretty cool, wouldn't it? They also have a call log. And they have a claims history. Last, we go and we talk to the actuarials. And the actuarials tell us they don't normally look at policies. They look at policies in an aggregated form. They look at what they call a risk pool. However, sometimes they do look at an individual policy. And what they do is on the policy, they will put down the risks, and they will put down the profitability. Has anybody ever gone through a process like this in terms of modeling? You lie. <laughs> now, what happens when we get into a room? And let's look at, for instance, sales. Sales had their policy. Their policy had a salesperson and had some commissions. What happens when we get into a room and they're thinking about this and we're talking about that? Can we communicate with each other? Why do we as IT have our own concept of what a policy is? Because we are smart bastards. Yes, we are very, very smart. And we love playing the telephone game. <laughs> Has anyone ever played the telephone game? What's it called in Austria? When you're a child and you sit in a circle 
and you whisper something to the person next to you, and they whisper and whisper until it comes back the other side. And it's never what you said to begin with. That's the problem that we run into here. We are unable to communicate. The whole idea of a bounded context is to recognize that these things actually exist and to not model that. We model things that people actually think. I know, that sounds scary. We model three of these. Each one is in a different context. We recognize that there are different contexts within an organization. This is a very important concept. If we model this, we cannot talk. How many people here have heard of the ubiquitous language? I really don't like the word ubiquitous because the ubiquitous language is not ubiquitous. The ubiquitous language lives in a context. We can only possibly have an ubiquitous language within one context. So here, we actually have three ubiquitous languages. We have one with the actuarials, we have one with sales, and we have one with claims. There's not one language that we speak to everybody. <clears throat> Because if we have one, we're going to run into a lot of problems with communication. Now, you can build one ubiquitous language, but it should not be IT that decides that. Organizations sometimes have one ubiquitous language, but it's a top-down thing. It's an organizational level decision that everyone is going to understand these concepts and we're going to share them. You cannot push this from IT. And even pushing at an organizational level is really hard. It normally will fail. So the concept of a bounded context is recognizing that these things actually exist. Now, this is not a technical term. This is a linguistic term. What we do when we look for bounded contexts is we look for words that people use and mean different things. When we talk to claims and they say a policy, they mean something very different than what sales means. Sales has their concept of what a policy is. Claims has a different concept. When we start looking around in an organization and talking to people, we'll start finding that different concepts group together. If they don't, it's really weird. Why do they group together? Why is Afrikaans different than Dutch? Why do people in Quebec speak different French than people in France? Why is Norwegian different than Swedish? What happens is, over time, we get boundaries placed between groups of people, and people specialize their language. Sales doesn't understand the same thing about policy as claims because they don't talk to each other that much. If they talked to each other a lot, they would have a shared concept about what it means. This is a natural thing that we do in language. So when we're going through and we're finding these, what we're really finding is partitions within the organization. And we're doing it through linguistics. We're not going through and doing a technical analysis. How many people here use SOA? Wow, very few. SOA is a great example of a bounded context, by the way. Does anyone know what SOA means in Dutch? <laughs> uh, SOA in Dutch, uh, I used to have a slide that I like to put up. It was SOAtest.nl. I'll give you a hint, they don't test services. <laughs> uh, it actually means sexually transmitted disease. And there is, there is a Dutch guy snickering to this day because he was on the committee that named it. <laughs> and in many ways, SOA, once it was taken over by middleware, has become a sexually transmitted disease. <laughs> this is related to SOA. When you go through and you analyze where your services are going to go, this is related to that. So what we're doing is we're finding boundaries in organizations. And those boundaries have a relationship to these boundaries. You should never have a service 
cross a bounded context boundary. It doesn't happen. So if we have, for instance, our policy here, and we have our policy way down here that no one can actually see, so I'm just going to draw it really quickly, and we say that we've got a context here, and we've got a context here, we should never have a service that falls between the two of them. If I have two completely disjoint ways of coming to an answer, and they both come to the same answer, does that make me more or less likely to be correct? More, obviously. It's another way of trying to figure out where your service boundaries go. If you end up with a service that crosses this boundary, you're doing something wrong. Now, one thing I love to do, and this is maybe a three or four day long process, this is not like a six months big upfront design type thing, is to go into an organization and to find where these boundaries are. Just listen to people talk. What do they mean when they say policy? Is it different than what you mean? Start grouping together the words. Figure out where these boundaries are. Then, write them down. So we might say that we've got sales in this organization. We have claims. Uh, let's see, we have accounting. And sometimes you don't even really need to do analysis. You just kind of know. Accounting is going to be different than everybody else. We have an uh, internet. We have public web. We have actuarials. Now, what I want you to do is go through on your first step and sit with the business and ask a really simple question. What level of our competitive advantage comes from this? Has anybody ever asked a question like that before? Why not? Is that important information? Let's say that we get really competitive advantage from sales. Is that a problem we will really want to understand? If we get no competitive advantage from accounting, why do we care? How many of you have infinite budgets? Anyone work for the government? If we don't have an infinite budget, then we should necessarily be trying to spend our money in an optimal way. We should try to spend more money where we get higher return on investment and less money where we don't. Things like coding standards are evil. How many of you will actually say that we're going to use the same method of development for all of our stuff? Why not? When we talk about domain-driven design, domain-driven design is an expensive process. It's expensive because we actually have to do analysis. We only want to do it in certain places. We don't want to do it across all of our models. It's a waste of resources. How much benefit do we gain by understanding the sales process? So what we do is we sit in a room and we say, I want you to start ranking these for me. Now, how many here use a, I don't know, a, like an agile practice for estimation? What do you guys use? Fibonacci, t-shirt sizing? <laughs> I like t-shirt sizing. I don't like Fibonacci because every time I've used Fibonacci, if people have a number, oddly, the amount of time people spend working on it converges upon that number. If somebody has a seven, oddly it takes seven hours worth of work. With t-shirt sizing, people tend not to have this mental problem. So with t-shirt sizing, we're going to give it a small, medium, or large. Now what I'll ask is, this list, the first step through, I want you to pick two or three smalls. If you come in and you, and you tell the person, I want to know what the competitive advantage is out of this, you're going to get larges all the way down. Instead, make them pick smalls first. So let's go through them really quick. Sales, is that a small, medium, or large? Large? How does our sales process differ from our competitors? 
If it doesn't differ, it's not competitive advantage. Generally, it's going to end up being small. What about actuarials? Again, think about how we differ from our competitor. Don't get me wrong, actuarials is very important for an insurance company, but we've been doing it the same way since the 1700s. It's a well-known model. You're writing it small. Internet? Medium, okay. How about our intranet? Small. I hope it's a small. <laughs> what about planes? When we were talking earlier, I said claims <coughs> is where they get their competitive advantage. They've got these automation rules that 90% of claims will never actually have to talk to a human being. So that's going to get a large. That's how they differ from their competitor. That's why people use this insurance company. What about, uh, I don't know, marketing? Why is it a large? This is a, one of the things we run into a lot. There are things that are very important inside of an organization that don't necessarily derive direct competitive advantage. There are things that we have to do right or else people will not accept us. But it's not necessarily how we differ from somebody else. Generally, you're going to end up with something like a small to medium lift. The easy question that we can ask ourselves when we're going through this, could I buy an off-the-shelf product to do this? If I can buy an off-the-shelf product to do this, we're probably not deriving competitive advantage from it. Because if we were, then anybody could do it. There are some that you'll find you'll almost never derive competitive advantage from. An accounting system. I'm sorry you're following a set way of doing things, you're not deriving competitive advantage from it. You have to do it right. If you're a public company, you have to actually get your numbers right on your profitability. You don't have much choice in that. But you're not deriving competitive advantage from it. What we're looking for here is how much each of these differs us from our competitors. Why would somebody use us as opposed to our direct competitor? This is not something that you can do on your own. You need business people to do this. But what we're doing here is we're actually calculating out a rough estimate of what our return on investment will be in each of these areas. Return on investment in terms of understanding what that problem is. How many people have heard that word before, return on investment? How many people think it sounds like pointy hair boss speak? <laughs> It's an important concept, though. Basically, what we're trying to figure out is for every euro I spend in analysis, what do I get back from it? I could spend two months going through the accounting system and understanding accounting and get all of you guys so you understand how accounting works. What's the value in that? What do I get back from my investment of that time? Okay, we understand accounting now. Yay. Does that further my goals in terms of the business? The next thing I want you to do, once you have all of these, is I want you to do the exact same exercise, but now from a technical perspective. I want you to put in complexity. So we might come through and we might say sales gets a small in terms of complexity. Claims, they get a medium to large. Accounting, they get a medium to large in terms of complexity. Internet, or sorry, intranet, gets a small. <clears throat> Actuarials gets a large in terms of complexity, but it's a small in terms of competitive advantage. This is a very normal thing to see, that we get a large complexity, 
small value. What you really want to watch out for when you're going through doing this is that you have a, a large in terms of competitive advantage and a small in terms of complexity. <laughs> if we stop and think about that for a minute, if we derive our competitive advantage from something that's not very complex, what's stopping our competitors from doing it? It doesn't make any sense. There's loads of these that we have to watch out for when we're going through and doing this exercise. But this information right here, and again, this is a very simple process that we do over the course of a couple days. This is not something you spend six months on. You can get through this in under a week. What this is telling us is a lot of information when we start trying to make architectural decisions. Has anybody ever made a buy versus build decision? Would this information help you? You can actually go both ways from this to buy versus build. We mentioned earlier accounting system. And one of the questions, could we buy this and still work? That told us it was a small in terms of competitive advantage. We can also go the other way. If we deemed it to be small in terms of competitive advantage, we can probably go buy the thing. Sales, we got a very small level of competitive advantage from. Maybe gold mine will work. It's not worth our time to go build something custom. And the whole reason why we're doing this is because if we want to do DDD, DDD is very, very expensive to do. How many people here have done DDD? How many people have built an object model and called it DDD? <laughs> it was probably an anemic domain model with a bunch of transaction script on top of it. That's not DDD. <laughs> DDD is a very, very expensive process to do because we're so focused on language. How many work in a mature domain model? Something like accounting. We've been doing it the same way for a long time. When we get into business systems, most of our domain models we go into are immature. They are domain models that no one's ever really worked in before, and that's why we can make money off of them. The problem is, when we go into domains like this, because they're immature, they're really hard to model. They're hard to model because there is no formalized model of them yet. When we go and talk to domain experts, they use nine words to mean one thing. They say a whole sentence to mean a word. Or maybe they, they say uh, one word, and it means 17 different things. If you go into accounting, that doesn't happen. In accounting, a transaction is well-defined. In our domain models, we tend not to have that. The real value of domain-driven design has nothing to do with your code. I know, that sounds really weird. The main value of domain-driven design is we're going to formalize this model. The model that people think in is going to become formalized. And I know everybody believes their system is going to live for 25 years. It probably won't. This formalization of the model and how we talk about our problems will extend beyond the life of your system. We are formalizing how we talk about and represent problems. This conceptual model that we build will live for a long time. That's the value of domain-driven design. It has nothing to do with code. We're formalizing the way people talk about problems. When we go through and do this, we start realizing that some places have huge competitive advantage. Other places have very small competitive advantage. We try to formalize our language in places where we receive competitive advantage. It's really odd. On the domain driven design list, we have uh, frequently asked questions. A lot of them are about bounded context. Although my favorite one is, where should I use domain driven design? This is the answer to that question. 
We use domain-driven design in areas where our organization derives competitive advantage. How many people here have tried using domain-driven design for their whole application? Or, I'm sorry, building an object model and calling it domain-driven design for their whole application? You waste a lot of money doing that. When we start going through this, when we start seeing internet, small, small, why not just throw out SharePoint? I know SharePoint's evil. <laughs> or how about Ruby on Rails? Why not throw out Ruby on Rails and just crank that out as fast as we can? We can isolate it pretty well from everything else. And you know what? If in two years we realize that that stuff won't work and we need more complexity, rewrite it. I know that's scary for developers. Rewrite it. The whole idea here is we're putting up strong boundaries. We can kill everything that lives in that boundary and redo it. It's not that we're going to throw away everything. This is not a bunch of modules living in a monolithic application. We can throw away entire portions of the system. And we make different decisions between each of these. It's okay to do. At the same time, it's okay to say we're going to make the same decision all the way through. There's reasons why I might want to do this. We have things that we have to look at from, let's say, a CTO level or a CIO level, like reproducibility, repeatability. Can I take developers and move them between each of these? Is that something that's important to me? We may make the same decision through all of these, but generally, we don't want to. <coughs> More often than not, we want to make a different decision inside of each one of these different groupings. It's important to remember that we get this information from language. This is not a concept that exists in your code, necessarily. What we're doing here is we're grouping out who speaks what language in the organization. And when we do this, it's going to be real boundaries. Because people don't talk to each other that much. When they, that happens, they change their language and specialize separately. Now, I'm sure there's some wonderful examples of this between Austrian and German. But the, these things exist in real life. The one situation you really need to watch out for with this is when you get an organization that combines some departments. Has anyone been in that before? And all of a sudden you end up with a group of people walking around that don't understand each other. That's kind of like what happens when we do this. Everyone walks around and no one understands each other. But sometimes in language, in the organization, if we have departments that get put together, they speak differently about the same ideas. It will resolve itself over time. You give them two years, they'll be talking, no problem. But in the transition period, it can be very rough. So you need to watch out for that because you can end up with really bad modeling if you are in that situation. This idea of bounded context is the core of domain driven design. If you don't understand this, you cannot understand anything else in domain driven design. The whole concept of building a domain model, a domain model lives in a context. I do not build a domain model for the entire application. Why do I not build a domain model for the entire application? Who's going to understand this? Aside from the development team. Let's imagine a conversation where we're talking with sales, and suddenly we start talking about claims automation rules. And they go, huh? Eh? What the hell are those? We cannot create a, what we call, crisp domain model. A domain model with a lot of explanation power if we try to model this. What we can create is a data model. Domains are not data. Domains are behavioral. How many people here have built a data-based domain model? Come on, admit it. How many people here built a behavioral model? Domains are inherently behavioral. 
When we go through and we do analysis, the nouns are way less important than the verbs. We listen for verbs. The best way to do this is to go through and start with use cases. How many people here have dealt with use cases before? But you built database models? How'd that turn out? I'm wondering the process of how we went from a use case to data. Because the use case is inherently talking about an action, it's a verb. Where'd we get the nouns from? It's important to remember when we're going through and doing domain modeling that if we don't do this process, we're going to waste resources, we're going to end up with a bad model, and probably our project's going to fail because we're going to spend so much time trying to do everything in the same way that we're not going to actually deliver. We're going to end up spending a bunch of time building a domain model for our intranet. Has anyone ever done that? You can admit it. I've seen many organizations actually do that. They built a domain model for their internet. It was quite odd to see. But it's important that we remember we only ever use domain driven design in places that we get a large medium or a large large. If we start seeing that we have a large small, remember that's something you need to push back on the business with. And that our real value from domain driven design comes because we push back. We do not go into a room and put a tape recorder down and listen to them talk. <clears throat> and then model what they're saying. We push back against them. You're using a whole sentence to describe this term. Is there a name for that? Should there be a name for that? Part of the modeling process is going to be defining aggregates. And when you go through and do that, and we're not going to have time to go through that on the board today, you are forced to push back against the domain experts. Because more often than not, if you don't, you're going to end up with a data model. Now, I wanted to go through bounded context very briefly with you guys, because they are the most misunderstood thing in domain driven design. I did not want to talk about value objects and entities and all the really boring stuff. Has anyone heard of a repository before? Getting bounded context is the most important thing with understanding domain driven design. If you don't understand what we've talked about, you will never understand anything else inside of that book. I recommend people when they read the book to read it in a different order than it's written. Read chapters one through three, then go to chapter 11. Read from chapter 11 to the end of the book, then come back to chapter 3 and read to the end of the book. I understand I told you to read chapter 11 to the end of the book twice. Trust me on this one, the second time you read it, you will have a different understanding than the first time. I know that sounds odd. But having read chapter 11 to the end of the book will help you understand what you read in the middle of the book. It's where things like this are discussed. And without knowing things like this, some of the stuff in the middle of the book gets to be very complicated to understand. It's easy to misunderstand what's in there. <clears throat> now, I wanted to talk to you guys a bit today as well about CQRS. Has anyone heard of CQRS? Someone told me the other day a really funny version of CQRS that we really should be calling it Seekers. I never thought about that before. Has anybody Googled CQRS? Does it still ask you if you met cars? <laughs> For the longest time, if you put in CQRS, we never thought about that. It's actually a very common misspelling of the word cars. If you go to CQRSinfo.com, where there's a lot of information on CQRS, including like a seven hour video, the subtitle is, Did You Mean Cars? <laughs> so now you guys understand where that came from. So we're going to go through a bit about CQRS today, and we're also going to talk about event sourcing. Does anyone know about event sourcing? Oh, very few people. This will be fun, then. Now, CQRS, I guess the first time I talked about it was 
four or five years ago at this point. It was at uh, QCon San Francisco. And it was one of the scariest presentations I've ever done. I'm talking about all these new ideas, and they're not really new ideas, they're very old ideas, but they're formulations of old ideas. And my front row was Gregor Hoppe, Martin Fowler, Eric Evans, And at the end of the talk, Eric comes up to me and he says, that was a terrible talk. <laughs> I think I understood 25% of what you said, which means everyone else understood less than five. <laughs> I came back a year later and I did the same talk again, and he said that was much better. <laughs> the ideas from CQRS came out of a very unusual system. How many people here work on normal business systems? How many people here do more than five transactions per second? How many people do more than 5,000? Oh, no? The system involved was doing peaks 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 per second. And it's a really odd decision at this point. And keep in mind, this was when we started it almost eight years ago now. We chose to use domain-driven design on a system that was doing 20,000 transactions per second. <coughs> That's a very unusual decision. But the reason we went with it was because we realized that although we could write everything in C and implement it in hardware, getting the answer correct and understanding the problems was more important than being fast. Who cares if you're fast and wrong? Do you have any idea how fast a computer automation can lose money in the stock market? <laughs> now, <laughs> we're going to go through quite a few things today. So we're going to start off with some of the issues that we found in this system. And then we're going to go through a whole bunch of breakthroughs that we had. The first one is explicit state representation. I know that sounds like really formalized language. In other words, we're going to talk about events. We're going to talk about using events as a form of storage. How many people here use a database? Up. Keep your hands up. Now I want you to put your hand down if you did not make a conscious, rational decision to use one. Oh, there goes the hands. If you did not sit at the beginning of your project and say, we're going to use a database and this is why. Very rarely do people actually think about why they're doing stuff. They just do it. The running joke is, and this is particularly bad in the Java world, so we're going to use Tomcat, we're going to use JBoss, we're going to use Hibernate, we're going to use Spring, we're going to use Oracle, and what are we building? <laughs> oh, a calculator. <laughs> wow, we can, we can have an infinite memory with Oracle on that. <laughs> You'd be surprised how much this happens. We're then going to talk about Command and query separation, and this is a very old slide, it's now called command and query responsibility segregation, or CQRS. We don't say the whole thing because it doesn't really come off the tongue that well. And the last thing we're going to talk about is asynchronous context mapping. These four things, when we did them, were completely different than anyone was doing in the domain driven design world. <coughs> then we'll go through a summary and hopefully we'll have a few minutes left for questions before we go off and eat. Now, the first issue that we ran into is building an algorithmic trading system, you really want to have a safety net. As we mentioned, a bad computer system can lose a lot of money really fast. You're making a thousand trades per second, and you lose a penny per share on every single one. That adds up really quickly. The next thing that we need is we wanted to have some level of scientific rigor. We wanted to be able to be repeatable. We wanted to be able to go back and look at information in completely deterministic ways. And I know that sounds like it would be special for an algorithmic trading system, but it's not. I'd be willing to bet you in your systems you want to be able to look at things in a deterministic way. And we'll talk about some of the advantages of being able to do that. The ability to look where you were two weeks ago, 
and see how everything was two weeks ago can be very, very valuable. And the last thing that we needed was we needed to have an audit. How many people have audits in their system of some kind? Maybe it's a log, a database table. Now, keep your hands up. Keep your hand up now if you can prove that it's correct. <laughs> What's the point of a log if you can't prove it's correct? This is our best guess as to what happened. We needed a log that we could prove was actually correct. We needed to be able to say this is what actually happened. Not, well, we had a log message there, we think. <laughs> the problem is a big one. And what we're going to go through, and this is available in a lot of different cases, by restructuring the problem, we made it an easy problem. If I were to go into your domain model today, and I wanted perfect logging inside of your domain model, it'd be a very hard problem to solve. But if we restructure the way that you build your model, it becomes a very easy problem to solve. Now, does everybody know who these people are? I think it's actually from around here, isn't it? So Hansel and Gretel, they were going through the forest. And they left an audit log. They dropped little pieces of bread. And unfortunately, the little woodland critters came and ate the bread behind them. And then they weren't able to walk out, and they ended up in a big problem. <laughs> they had the problem of having a non-provable audit log. <laughs> Things were eaten behind them. And we all know how they turned out. They would have been much better off in terms of risk mitigation if they had kept the bread. Then they would never would have gone in the house because they wouldn't have been hungry. <laughs> it's the same thing that we run into. Our biggest breakthrough was all centered around this audit log. I know that sounds odd. Our biggest breakthrough was realizing that things happen in our system. And instead of modeling them implicitly, we need to model them explicitly. If I have an object and I make some changes to it, and I tell Hibernate to persist it, will it figure out what changes were there? Generally, yeah. It's going to go update the database to make it equivalent. But that's an implicit concept. If I were to have a bug, and in changing someone's address, I have changed their first name to George all the time. Would Hibernate still find it? Of course. In the main journey design, we have a phrase that gets used a lot. It's making the implicit explicit. Now, up until this point, most of our domain models have implicitly been saved. We look at state and implicitly derive what we need to save to the database. Instead of doing that, we decided to make our change explicit. We represented every single state transition that occurs in the domain with the concept of an event. An event is not this big, complicated thing. An event is a little class. It has a name. The name is always a verb in the past tense. It carries with it some data. The data is the data that's important that that action occurred. As an example, we could have an inventory item deactivated. It's going to have an ID. And maybe it has on it a reason as to why the inventory item was deactivated. It's really important to remember it's always a verb in the past tense. If you do them in English, you will find some examples where you want to use a noun. Earthquake. The noun is actually representing a verb that happened. Don't use those. It gets confusing. And I know it's going to sound odd, but you could say earthquake. Earthquake occurred. Earthquake measured. Always use a verb in the past tense. 
This becomes even more important when we start talking about other kinds of nouns. So imagine getting an event called customer. You're receiving it. Here, customer. Why are you receiving it? Oh, the customer is created. There's always an implicit verb that's associated with the noun. Represent it and always use it in the past tense. The reason we put it in the past tense is because we need to represent that this is an action that has occurred. It's finished occurring. This is not something that's still going on. If you throw an exception, you don't undo it. If you want to undo it, you need to do a compensating action. Keeping the language in the past tense will help you a lot. It will help you when you start reading your code. And we're going to talk about another concept in a little while. It's called command. A command is always in the imperative tense. And since everybody here speaks German, I'll, I'll give you a hint. Write them in German. German is the language of the imperative. <laughs> <laughs> it's telling the system to do something. If I tell you to do something, can you tell me to piss off? Sure. If I tell you I did something yesterday, do you have a time machine? Can you go back to yesterday and undo what I did? The language helps us understand what we're allowed and not allowed to do. This is especially true when we start talking about juniors. Juniors, when they get the language, can understand in an easier way what they are allowed and not allowed to do in code. Now, once we have this concept of events, and we represent every state change that occurs within our domain as an event, oddly, events match to use cases, by the way. A use case occurred. We can do some other really interesting stuff. How many of you have worked in a financial system before? How many of you have a bank account? <laughs> Could you imagine if your bank kept your bank account as a table called account and then there was a balance column on it? <laughs> How many of you would like that? You know, you call up and they say, this is your current balance. In a financial system, like, for instance, your banks, the way I get your balance is I sum all of the previous transactions that you've ever done. That gives me your balance. Now, I may denormalize a column called balance for performance reasons. But if we have a disagreement, if the balance is correct, I can sum up all of your previous transactions. The same thing happens in accounting. Basically, we write <coughs> all of your previous transactions, and we can sum them, and we find out what the total is. We have another benefit with this. I can tell you what your balance was at any given point in time by only summing the transactions to that point in time. Has anybody ever looked at a report where you might want to look at what your balance was last month? Do you think that what they actually keep is monthly rows? <laughs> we can do this with any system. We will find that all mature domain models, any mature domain model that you go and look at, will not have the concept of current state as just being state. Current state is always derived from a series of previous behaviors. Does anybody in here write functional code? Maybe Scala, F sharp. I, I will say, and you will understand it in one sentence, and you don't have to listen for the next five minutes. Current state is a left fold of previous behaviors. I know, that's, those, are, those are university words. <laughs> so here's a representation of current state for a purchase order. So we have a purchase order which has some line items associated with it. And it has some shipping information. Has anyone ever built a model like this? Where we represent current state, I don't know, in a database? This is 
not the only way of representing the concept of a purchase order. We have other ways that we can represent this same information. Another way of representing this might be to represent it through a series of behaviors associated with our cart. So now what we have is we have a cart created, and there are actually three things here, but if I made all three, they got really little in the slide. So we've got three items added, and then we have shipping information being added. At any given point in time, I can replay those five things that have happened and get this. But there's a lot of benefits towards storing that. This pattern that we're going to talk about is event sourcing. It's rebuilding our current state by replaying behaviors we've done in the past. Now, that original slide that I had, it took me forever to find that. This is a bookkeeper who is erasing something in the middle of their ledger. What happens to bookkeepers that do that? <laughs> they work at Enron. <laughs> we are never allowed to go back and change events that have happened. These are things that our system actually did. Our model is additive only. We're going to go stronger than that. Our model is append only. We are only ever allowed to add new events. We can never go back and change an event. We can never go back and delete an event. If we want to delete information, we have to add a new event that says to delete the previous event. An example of this might be with our shopping cart. So now we have a cart being created, three items being added, one item being removed, and shipping information being added. Is this equivalent to me having a cart being created and two items being added and then shipping information being added? Is it equivalent? I see some yeses, some noes. It depends on how we want to look at it. If we go back to this, the two come out equivalent. But what if my model wanted to track how often things are removed? Are they equivalent then? Not at all. Now, that's a very important concept because the main value of dealing with events like this is we're not losing information. Now, a bunch of you said that you're using databases. How many of you have an update or a delete statement in your code somewhere? Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. You're losing information. <laughs> If you have an update anywhere in your code, you are losing information. Now, how many of you believe that you can predict where your business is going to be in five years? And what questions they're going to ask you in five years? No? How about five months? Do you think you can predict that? Five days? So you're losing information in an area where your organization derives competitive advantage, and you are, what, uh, predicting based on what metric, which information to lose. How do you know the value of the information that you're losing? Do you take out your magic eight ball? <laughs> Seems probable. If we cannot predict what the business is going to want and how they value things in five years, how can we lose it today? Especially when we're in an area where we derive competitive advantage, this could make or break my company in five years. But we as developers are going to make the decision as to what's important and what's not. When we store events, because we are append only, we do not lose any information. The value of this is best seen going through an example. Let's imagine that we're a point of sale web retailer. And to start with, we're going to use this model. And our business expert comes to us and he, he's got this crazy idea. He thinks that people that remove items from their cart 
within one minute and 35 seconds before they check out are more likely to buy that item in the next six months than the other algorithms that we have that we present them with. Things like uh, what their friends bought. So he puts it on our board. We take it off the board, we go implement the feature. We actually add to our structural model here a thing called line items removed. And we start storing that. We write a report that will go through and look for line items removed within 1 minute and 35 seconds before checkout. We push to production. He goes and runs his report. What does he see? Nothing. There's nothing. We're going to start getting data now, and over the course of time, he'll be able to see it. Let's change that. Let's go do it here. So we write some handlers to generate out a projection of this information. When we are dealing with events, anytime we want to get information, we write what's called a projection. We project a structural model off of the behavioral stream. So we write some little event handlers. We write an event handler that gets the item removed. Another one gets the checkout. And what happens is, when he gets the remove, he writes down that the remove is there, and when he gets the checkout, he looks to see if it's within 1 minute and 35 seconds. We write a report that queries off this data model. But we're going to do something different. When I release it, I run it through the entire event log from the beginning of time. When he runs his report, what does he see? He sees all of that information as if it's always been in the system. We take his new idea and we take it back in time. So when he views his report, it's filled with data as if the system had been like that throughout its entire existence. What is the business value of that? This ability to look at two years ago as we would want to look at it today. To look at past times in an infinite number of possible ways. This ability to go back and look at this in new and interesting ways is the real value that events bring. Events have lots of cool technical things too, but they're mostly programmer pornography. <laughs> <laughs> the main reason that we look at dealing with events is because we have this ability to go back in time. Now, I've learned over time that a lot of people start thinking that they need to use event sourcing in order to get that. You don't. You only need to have an event log. Event sourcing is the rebuilding of my domain objects from that log. I don't need to rebuild my domain objects to have the log. You can get this business value with only having a log. We'll talk about why event sourcing on top of that can be cool. But it's important to remember that we can do it only with an event log. We don't need to actually load our domain objects from this in order to get this value. We just need to have this. The main reason we're going to go through and look at this kind of stuff is because we provide a massive amount of business value from it. Because we're not losing information. How many of you have had to say no to a domain expert before? Yeah, we had that information, but uh, we deemed it to be not important, so we lost it. We were never tracking it. It's a really crappy place to be. Of course, that's not what you say. You say, like, we can put that in the system requirements. We can put it in right now. Now, there's all sorts of other fun things we can do with our event log. How many of you have had a bug in your code? <laughs> and there's people with their hands not up. Are you, are you guys not available? <laughs> How many of you have a phone call from an angry user? It's Joe. Joe calls up and tells you that he's been trying to do this and the system's a piece of crap and it doesn't work, but he fixed it. And he's saying, well, thank you for the reproducible bug report. 
The system was broken, but now it works. Okay, great. Now what? If we're using an event log and going with CQRS type systems, one of the benefits is we can go back. I have the entire event log. I can look at the system as it was when it was failing for him. I have a little app inside of Visual Studio. What it allows me to do is to take a command and I save all my commands that come into the system and it allows me to run that command as it ran at that point in time. <coughs> and I run it with the debugger. And I step through the code. I am stepping through the code as it ran when it ran that command. Did the command fail because of a bug? Or did it fail because it was supposed to fail? How many of you can bring up your system in the state that it was yesterday? at 2 p.m. It's very valuable when we talk about debugging to be able to do this. The reason we can do this is because we have written down all of our events from the system, all the behaviors the system has done. We can replay them to a point in time. Going along with this, has anybody here ever built a, a temporal object model? Martin Fowler wrote a lot about these. And if you go and read what he wrote, they're very, very scary concepts. The persistence for them is it's just disgusting. It's massively complicated. If we're using events, all I have to do to have my temporal model is to only replay events to a given point in time. It becomes a very easy problem. I can replay all of my events up until September 27, 2007. And what am I left with at that point? The object or projection as it was in 2007. If I want to replay to 2009, I just replay the events up to that point. There's other things we can do using our events. How many of you do smoke tests? One thing that we would do, before every single release, we would rerun every command the system had ever processed and have it produce a series of events. We would compare those events against the events that it did last week. And we would look for differences. Are these differences that we expected based on code changes we made? Or are these things we didn't expect? We caught a huge number of unexpected consequences in this way. Now, we wouldn't catch all of them because you can never catch all of them. But we caught a lot of them and we avoided production problems. This ability to replay things in deterministic ways is very valuable in terms of how we rationalize about systems. And we'll talk a little bit later, it's also very valuable when we talk about testing. Now, I'm surprised no one has yelled out, but what happens when I have a million events? That could be a slight problem if we're using event sourcing, couldn't it? So to load my object, I need to load a million events. There's a pattern that we use to get around this. The pattern that we use is called a rolling snapshot. Now, we conceptually think about our event log as basically a long queue. But we don't have to use things like this. Instead, what we can do, <coughs> instead of going from the beginning of time to the end of time, we go from the end of the time backwards. So we start with number six. We say, are you a snapshot? No, put you on a stack. Number five, are you a snapshot? No, put you on a stack. Then we get to the snapshot. The snapshot is a serialized version of that object at that point in time. So we take that out, and then we pop off the stack and push the events in and have it replay the events from that point forward. We could have 100 million events previously. This is telling us it was at that state at this point in time. Snapshots change things a little bit conceptually. But when we think about the problem, we always imagine 
that we go through this route. We don't use snapshots unless we get problems. More often than not, an aggregate will not have that many events. If we have 20, you don't need a snapshot. 50, you probably don't need a snapshot. Start getting into a couple hundred and let's think about it. Snapshots have a downside associated with them. If we're going through and we imagine that we're doing this process and we don't have any snapshots, we've already said that there are an infinite number of possible projections off of that event stream. <clears throat> what happens when I refactor my domain objects? How many of you refactor domain objects today? And you do what? You write an update script for the SQL Server? If I'm saving events, an infinite number of possibilities can come off of my events. Does my storage structure change if I want to refactor how my domain object works? No. I can refactor the domain object and it's completely independent of my storage mechanism. If I use a snapshot, all of a sudden now I have a coupling. If I refactor my domain object, and I have a snapshot here, and we'll, we'll just take the simplest version of this, and we'll imagine this is a serialized version of our domain object. Now I have to go back and update all of those. So there's a downside to using snapshots. That's why I recommend people only use them where you really, really need them. Don't use them just for everything. They're a heuristic. They're to take away that worst case where this thing has 20,000 events and you don't want to have to load them all. Because it's going to be slow. If you have 20, don't bother. Most aggregates have very few events. 20 would be a lot. But it's important to remember that it is only a heuristic. Conceptually, we always think about this. Now, another interesting thing with events, and how many people here have used a document database? How many people here have gone to the doctor before? When you go to the doctor, does he open up the folder that he has for you and take a picture of you and take the old picture of you and throw it away and put the new picture in? Well, what does he do? He like puts papers in every time you get there? So you visit the doctor, he writes out a form saying what happened with you and he adds that to your folder? Does he ever go in and remove pieces of paper from your folder? No, he just keeps adding new ones. And then you go to the doctor with your grandmother, and you realize her folder's like that thick. <laughs> we can do the same thing with events. We can put our events into these folders. And we end up with a folder per aggregate. How well would this work with a document database? Fast. It'd be very fast. Now, there is one operation that we need that's unusual from a document database. Most document databases support forward streaming. If we want to use snapshots, we need to have reverse streaming. We need to stream the document backwards. A lot of them don't support that operation. But if we go with this mechanism, we can be nearly infinitely scalable. Now, there is one problem with event sourcing. And that's going to bring us into our next pattern. If all I store is a series of events that my system has done, <coughs> there's only one query I can execute. Get me the events for this object. What if I want to issue a query like, show me the customers with the first name of Greg? Can I issue that query to my event stream? I don't have current state inside of my event stream. I have no way of querying for current state. And that's going to lead us into CQRS. The only query that I will ever execute against an event stream is get events for aggregate. I pass an aggregate ID, I get back a series of events. I never query anything else. But I imagine in your systems, they tend to want things like searching, guessing, the ability to look up a customer by a name, This is my stereotypical architecture that I like to go through with people. 
And we'll go through it very quickly. At the top, we have a data storage. You'll note I didn't call it a database, but it's probably a SQL database. On top of that, we've got a domain model, then we have some application services, and I put a remote facade here. It doesn't have to be a remote facade. It could be that you just have a layer boundary, not a tier boundary. All the way down here, we have client. Now, the way this interaction happens is the client will say, give me customer number one, two, three, four. It'll go to the domain model, it'll load it up, and then we'll project DTOs off of the domain model and give them back to the client. The client will then interact with the data and send back up a customer. We can imagine that we deactivated a customer. So it sends back up the customer DTO with activated equals false. That goes in and it gets mapped back to the domain model and then saved to the database. Has anyone built a system like this? Has anybody viewed Microsoft guidance on how to build a system like this? <laughs> now there's some good things about this. This is fairly simple. Pretty much everybody knows how to build this. I can get any developer off the street who'll understand this. He's built it before. But there's some really awful things about this. One of my favorite talks I ever did was at the Paris DDD group. And I asked how many people were using this architecture, and just about everybody raised their hands. The thing is, you can't do domain-driven design with this architecture. It's impossible. The reason you can't do it is because your domain would only have four verbs inside of it. Create, read, <laughs> update, delete. Can you imagine a domain expert walking around only using those four verbs? We're also losing the intent of what the client wanted to do. We know that activated equals false. Why does activated equal false? Do we have any idea? All we can have up here is data. Because we lose the intent down here. We lose the operation that they want us to do. This is where a command will come in. Instead of the system telling us what to save, Tell us what to do. There's other problems with this architecture. Has anybody ever scaled this? We all know how to scale it. You buy a bigger database. I'm curious. Has anyone ever found it odd that when we go through and we start looking at all the documentation and these wonderful frameworks that help us do this, that they tend to be written by the same people that sell us our databases? <laughs> It's a very odd pattern. They put us in a situation where basically they are a scaling story. And we pay them lots of money to scale. This is not the only way of building systems. But we end up with a lot of other problems up here. People who have built this in that domain model. How many of you use N Hibernate? Entity framework? Hibernate? How many of you enjoy writing queries? <laughs> How many of you have had your DBA tell you this is the query I want you to run? Now all you have to do is make Hibernate spit that thing out. How many of you have sprinkled prefetch paths around? Yes, I know you should normally lazy load this, but right now, don't. These are all signs of a problem. They're code smells. How many of you have getters on your domain objects so that you can project DTOs off of them? It's a pretty dumb reason to have getters all over your domain objects, isn't it? The reason we're running into all of these problems here is because we're taking one model and trying to have it do a lot of really unrelated things. And we'll just skip through that because we already went through that. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to separate reads and writes. That's all CQRS is. How many of you have heard of CQS? CQS is by Bertrand Meyer. It's an object-oriented principle. Basically, it says we've got two concepts, a command and a query. A command is defined as a method that has a void return type. 
or if we're in a functional language, a unit return type. A query is an object that returns anything except for void. Now, commands are allowed to mutate state. Queries are not allowed to mutate state. The reason for this was because he was working with design by contract. And very often you have queries inside of your contracts. It'd be really odd if I didn't check your contract and therefore you stopped working. Let's say I checked your contract at compile time versus at runtime. If we had mutations on a query, you might not work anymore. Now, Martin Fowler would say that there are some places where you don't want to follow CQS. His example would be a stack. Imagine writing stack.pop following command and query separation. It mutates state and returns a value. So instead, you would have stack.preparePop, and then you could call stack.pop as many times as you want, and it's going to return you the same object back. <clears throat> It may not feel natural at first, but has anybody ever worked with a RESTful queue? That's exactly how they work. I say queue, prepare DQ, and it gives me back a link to the object that I can get, and I can call it as many times as I want, and it's idempotent. So very often, even following it with these things that seem weird will give you advantages. Command and query responsibility segregation uses the same definition of commands and queries. But it goes one step further. Basically what it says is, we take all of the commands and we put them on one object, and we put all the queries onto another object. Here we can imagine that we had our remote facade to start with. Now we have two remote facades. This one has only commands on it. This one has only queries on it. What this is allowing us to do is to make different decisions. We can specialize our writes differently than our reads. As an example, we introduced here something called a thin read layer. Our thin read layer, we can imagine, uses link to SQL and projects directly out of the database straight to DTOs. Would that be more or less complex than doing it off of our domain model? Far less. If we go back and we look at our queries <clears throat> here, we need to understand the database. Then we need to understand the domain model. And when we write queries, we go through an ORM that transforms our queries. So we need to really understand that process in order to get the query that we want. When we are using a thin read layer, and we go directly back to the data storage, we've got a much simpler problem. I query directly to data storage. If I wanted to, I could even use ADO.net and pop in, this is my actual query I want to run. Now, I wouldn't recommend doing that directly, at least write a little bit of a library on top of it so you don't do all the connection stuff every time. But we can choose the simplest possible thing here. Over here, we just got rid of all of our getters on our domain objects because we don't need to project DTOs off of them anymore. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. What we end up with is we end up with two sides. We have the right side, which only processes transactions. And we have a read side, and the read side only processes queries. This sounds like a very easy thing to do, and it is but it will make our code so much simpler because the two concepts were really unrelated. And by doing two separate solutions that are specialized for each case, we actually end up with a simpler overall view than if we try to build one model that does both. But there's a lot of other differences that we're going to run into. But as a takeaway, I want everybody to remember that a single model will be more complex than multiple models. Always. I've never found a case where building one model to handle both ended up being simpler. 
Now, let's go through some of the differences between commands and queries. You guys have commands and queries in your system. <coughs> the first question that I would ask is, do they even have the same perception of the data? So in our domain model, we're behavioral. What we're modeling is invariance on transactions. We're modeling transactional boundaries. When we talk about a query model, it tends to be screens. What information are we showing on screens? Is the information that we show on screens the same format as our transactional invariance? Probably not. And the reason that we are screen-centric is because we only want to have one DTO for each screen that we show. We don't want a screen to have to send us 20 requests because it's going to be perceived by the user to be faster if it's only one. Our DTOs are focused on the screens inside of our application and the data that we show, or reports, depending on what we're looking at. Our domain model is focused on transactional invariance and boundaries. The two may be somewhat similar, but that's random. It's a random chance that they happen to be similar. They are two very different problems. And in most applications, they will be different. We have another one. You guys have applications. How many reads of data do you get per write? Most applications I see are at least 10 to 1. There will be 10 reads for every one write of data. Very often, it will be higher. I have worked with places that had over 10,000 reads for every write. Now, if we're going to talk about normalization formats, when I process transactions, I want to be in third normal form. If I'm doing writes, I want to be, or sorry, reads, first normal form would be optimal. How many people here have a third normal form model? And how many reads do you do versus writes? So why did you optimize writes? When we start talking about scaling, we generally need to scale reads, not writes. I may want to have 20 read models, but only one write model. If we try scaling the other way, we scale reads and writes together. That's a very hard problem. Scaling reads separately is a very easy problem. All we would have to do is drop in a little pipeline with our events in it, which goes over to some denormalizers, which run <laughs> into a separate model. We could use third normal form on that side and first normal form on this side. And we can do this because most queries operate on relaxed consistency. And people tell me, no, 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 our data needs to be fully consistent. <laughs> if I ask you for a DTO and you give it to me, and somebody changes the data while that packet is in the network, do you have like a yo-yo packet? <laughs> do you pull it back and say, no, 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 you don't get that one, and give me a new one? If that's the case, then we're already eventually consistent. <laughs> we're operating with relaxed consistency. And it's okay. Reads are almost always eventually consistent. Even if you query a database, you issue a query and you show the user the information from the query. Could that information have changed? Sure. Almost all queries have relaxed consistency. Now, validating transactions on eventually consistent data, that's really hard. So we might say that on this, that here, we're eventually consistent. Here, we're fully consistent. This eventual consistency is also going to allow us to scale. Could I have two of those? Sure. I just take that pipeline and I multiplex it. Could I multiplex it to a thousand read models? 
No problem. I get a thousand of those read models going out. I can scale near linear my read side. My write side, it's consistent. I can't necessarily scale it. I have not guaranteed partitionability for it. But most systems don't need scalability on writes. They need it on reads. <laughs> it's an important distinction between reads and writes. Now, getting into writes, writes have some differences with them as well. And I'm going to put this up, but I'm going to reword it slightly. This is a very strong statement. How many people here have getters and setters in the domain model? Setters are evil. If you have setters in your domain model, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> getters are more of a smell. We have to look at why you have getters. Now, years ago, I gave this presentation for the first time, and there was a speaker before me who was talking about domain-driven design, and he put up pieces of his model. And I went running to him during the break, and I said, oh, can I get your code? I want to use a slide in my talk. <laughs> And okay. And we, we, had, we had a good time afterwards. I, I made sure to buy him a beer that night. <laughs> this was his code. <clears throat> this is one of the domain model objects that they have. Those are getters and setters. The four things in the middle were the actual behavior of the thing. Everything else is getters and setters. This is a very common thing to run into. This is not really a domain model. This is a data model. It's an abstraction of a database. It's meant for saving data, not for dealing with behaviors. Our domain models are behavioral. They are not data oriented. When we apply CQRS, we can stop worrying about a lot of this stuff because we no longer project DTOs off of our domain model. That's the main reason people sprinkle getters all over their domain objects. So that they can copy information to a DTO. Now, who wants to write tests for this interface? I always ask people, how many people here Test that what you expect to have happen, happened. How many people write tests that what you didn't expect to have happen, didn't happen? Which is more important? That th my expectation occurred, or that what I didn't expect to have happen, didn't happen? They're of equal importance. The problem is, when we get an interface like this, the second question becomes a combinatorial problem. <laughs> How many tests would I need to write to check that what I didn't expect to have happen didn't happen? So let's see, I call add tag, and I expect that when I get the tag, I get it back. But now I need to call all of these other ones to make sure that they still have the same data. I didn't affect them. When we're writing behavioral code, behavioral code, we test both. And with events, it becomes really easy. Since all of my state transitions occur through an event, I just assert that there's only one event. There would have to be another event if something else wanted to change. I don't have to go through and do that combinatorial problem. Again, this is an example of taking something that would be really hard and changing the problem so that it's very easy. Instead of trying to figure out how to do it in our scenario, we try to figure out a scenario that it would be easy in. Okay. Now, the last thing we have to talk about is asynchronous context mapping. I know that's a really <laughs> long term. The idea is how we integrate with systems. And we never integrate in a synchronous way. Instead, we send events over to other systems. We already said that when we use our event log, we have an infinite number of possible projections we can do off of it. Well, you can also do an infinite number of projections off of my event log. So instead of you asking me questions, I'm going to send you events. And you can keep your own concept of what that means to you. This is a very important concept. It's important because when we talk about bounded contexts, 
Think about two teams and who's working on what. You're working inside of your context. We may have a inventory system pushing out data. And marketing may have some marketing concepts based on that data. We don't go build those marketing concepts into the inventory system. Instead, we push events out. We integrate through events. And it's really important to remember that when we talk between bounded contexts, it's almost always relaxed consistency. Has anybody ever built an integration between two systems that used a transaction? How painful was that later? <laughs> I actually worked with one company years ago that basically they had one rule. Their one rule was all business logic must be in the database, yes. including integration logic. So what they did was they did linked servers between all the different databases. What do you think happened when accounting went down? <laughs> Nothing worked. If you lost any one system because they were all transactional, nothing worked in the entire organization. And then they started trying to work around this problem with all sorts of weird, hokey ways. <clears throat> when we're integrating between systems, we're almost always operating with relaxed consistency. And we're better off integrating through our events than we are integrating through synchronous actions. Because if we go with an asynchronous way of dealing with things, when systems are down, we keep running. We don't go down as well. Now, just before we go into the summary, there's two very quick things I want to go through. The first one is when we come through and we start modeling things in events, time becomes a very important concept within our domain models. How many of you think that time is actually important in your domain? Why have you not been modeling time? Events show us that things are temporal. There's things that occur in time. Now, one of the things we'll also get into in terms of time is when we start talking about eventual consistency, how long is it? As an example, I need to get data over to the system. Does it need to be there in one second, or can it be two days? An interesting pattern will start emerging. The data that needs to be there very quickly tends to be the most important data in the system. It's the one that we should spend the most time modeling. The data that takes a long time is tending to be less important. It's a good heuristic we can use in terms of figuring out where the real core stuff is inside of our model. But it's also really important that we're modeling time inside of this process. Because domains, in general, are temporal. They're temporal because people are involved with them. Overall, this ability to use relaxed consistency is going to allow us to be more available and more scalable. Now, this is actually going to be fun because this is an interesting group. Anybody know who this guy is? Heidegger. I've tried for a very long time to somehow get Heidegger into a software engineering talk. <laughs> now, we talked a bit before about language and how language is really important. For instance, we write all of our commands in German. All of our events are verbs in the past tense. What this does is it allows us to understand what's going on in the system through language. When we go to write tests, for instance, a test would be specified as given a series of events in the past tense. When I tell the system to do this, expect this series of events in the past tense. OK, take your events and move them from camel case to spaces in between them. Put your command in. And it should read like an English sentence. If you try to do any other way of putting them together, they don't make any sense. So given deactivated inventory item, that doesn't make any sense. Given an inventory item has been deactivated, 
The language leads you to specifying things in the appropriate ways. This is especially good when we've got juniors on the team. My favorite thing to ask juniors is, could you use that in a sentence for me? And when they try and they're doing something wrong, it doesn't work. And I say, well, how would you say that in a sentence? And they say it and they go, ah, I got it. And they know what they have to do in code based on how they said it in a sentence. The value of that can be huge as a teaching tool. Now, to go through and summarize my takeaways for people. <coughs> the first one is that state transitions in our system, the moving from one thing to the next is a really, really important concept. It should not be modeled implicitly. We should make this an explicit thing inside of our model. It's not that I changed some stuff and then hibernate saved it. Something just occurred. It should be modeled. It should have a name. What does it mean when an inventory item is deactivated? The event tells me that. It's explicitly saying this is what it means that an inventory item is deactivated. The next one is that getters and setters are a smell. I'm not going to call them an anti-pattern. That's too strong. Well, setters are an anti-pattern. Getters, uh, they, they stink. Literally. If you are in your domain model and you're finding getters and setters everywhere, you're doing something wrong. Go through and look for what the behaviors actually are. It's odd, but I teach a class. One of the things that I teach is where to put a method. You'd be surprised how few developers actually know which object to put a method on. It goes on the one where the data is. But very few developers actually know this. We will end up in 20 minute discussions about which object we should put it on. Getters and setters lead us to procedural code. If you're writing an object-oriented model, you should try, at least as an exercise, to ban them from your vocabulary. Try writing your problem with no getters and setters. It's a difficult exercise, but it's worthwhile. When we deal with between context interaction, it's always going to be eventually consistent. This will help us because if we go down, the other system is still up, we don't take them down with us. And we've all been in a situation where we had the accounting system goes down so nothing in the organization works anymore. And the last thing, and this is probably the key take home, is that we're going to end up building complexity into a system by choosing one model. One model to handle what the system does increases complexity. We find ourselves in a situation where we go through and we try to find the model that sucks the least for all of the cases that we're using it. If we build out many little very specific models and we specialize them, we can try to find the optimal model for each of those places. There's a big difference between finding an optimal model versus doing trade-offs to find the one that sucks the least across all of them. You laugh, but it introduces a massive amount of complexity. And very often, we don't pick the one that sucks the least. CQRS is all about making different decisions in different places. It's allowing us to specialize things separately. And there's lots of different ways that we can specialize things, both from a software perspective that we looked at, and there's also business perspective stuff. How we manage teams can be different in different places. CQRS at its core is all about specialization. And a huge amount of complexity that we run into today is all because we try to build one model that does many things. And the many things are unrelated. And we try to build this one thing to do all of them. Separating them and specializing them will make the problem simpler. And with that, because I'm running a few minutes late, I will grab any questions. I have a couple of questions uh, concerning database size. 
through the support. So what you're basically saying is that uh, you have two database, uh, one just for uh, getting stuff written down uh, with the older events, and the second one in personal form where it can do the requests. That's correct. Yep. Uh, how do you deal with this if you have large amounts of data, especially for the, the reads? If you have just a uh, flat table, mm -hmm. uh, it can really lame. Um, I put it there as a first normal form model. It's not always a first normal form model. Um, very often, uh, one of the questions I like to ask clients, uh, they'll show me a web app, for instance. And my question is, what changes depending on which user I am? And they say, oh, well, nothing changes on the page. And my response is, well, why don't we just use, I don't know, HTML as our view model? And we'll actually have, we'll generate up straight HTML, and then we know how to scale Apache. Other examples might be on our first normal form side, the read side, we might use a graph database. We're going to pick the right thing for our data. Sometimes that might be a document database over there. Sometimes it might be a graph database. In most business systems, it turns out to be a first normal form database because they want to do a lot of OLAP type stuff with it. But depending on the problem, we may go for different things. We can also start getting into partitioning there, sharding, um, if we're dealing with really big data, we might go with something like a big table, uh, do map reduce across large data sets. There's lots of different options that we have there. It doesn't necessarily equate to being OLAP. What it means is uh, that if you already have the, the database working and uh, your, your business objects are working with this, uh, one thing you're doing is you're producing more complexity and more stuff by uh, building another database with more additional information, which makes sense, as you told it before. But uh, for, from, from the side of the one who's going to buy a service and just going to, to uh, give the infrastructure, it's hard a uh, problem to, to explain it then. Well, in terms of the infrastructure, the cost would actually be equivalent. Um, in terms of the infrastructure, um, you're going to end up with basically the same thing, the event store, uh, can actually be the same physical hardware as the read model. Doesn't have to be, but it can be. Uh, for a small system, it's very often going to be. Getting more towards what you were saying, you were saying that you've got these business objects, domain objects that are already working with a database. My question would be, why the hell are you going to apply CQRS now? What business value are you giving by doing it? Um, if we're going to do it for programming's sake, okay. I think we have something more interesting that we could be working on from a business perspective. Um, very often people will try to build stuff into existing systems where it provides no business value. If you actually had something that was going to be giving business value to them, like let's say the introduction of an event log, then by all means um, they would be willing to take the expense of doing it. If we're doing it for doing its sake, it doesn't make any sense. So you told us a lot about the problems of, so to say, traditional systems and the advantages of CPS and event sourcing. From your point of view, what are the problems associated with uh, using event sourcing and CPS? The biggest problem that I find is very closely related to domain driven design. Um, it's people are using it in the wrong place. They will go through and use event sourcing and CQRS to build a web-based diary for their little sister. <laughs> One of the big issues when you start getting into CQRS and event sourcing, and domain-driven design as a whole, is you actually need to do analysis. It's no longer CRUD. There's real behaviors there, and we actually have to do analysis on it. And people have a tendency of saying, for whatever reason, I've never understood this about people, we're going to take this and we're going to do it everywhere. The other big problem that I find is people don't actually do context boundaries and they try to build one monolithic system using CQRS and event sourcing. And they end up in a lot of pain because of that. If you're using it in the right places, you're almost always going to turn out better. The other reason that I, I the other big thing I find, just to add, is people use event sourcing where it doesn't make any sense. Generally, I will not go into a company and say, yes, we're going to move you to event sourcing. I will build out a third normal form model on that side. I will, ice, I will still put out events, 
And basically the events will have little of that handlers to write in the third normal form model. And then I will check the cost of keeping that model. Let me just back up to the slide really quick that has it on there. There it is. We can imagine that that's a third normal form model with little event handlers coming out of here. That's a first normal form model. I will then measure the cost of having that third normal form model because it's very expensive. And then I'll come back to the business and I might say something like, yeah, so tonight I was thinking about trying something that's really weird and experimental. And from my quick estimates, um, we could save 2.7 million euros next year and I'll have it at staging in the morning. So the business person did not hear anything except for save 2.7 million euros right before our morning. But words, experimental, non-standard, any of that stuff never hit him. But one of the big problems, especially in event sourcing, is getting in and talking with the business about it because it's going to freak them out. DBAs are going to freak out when you tell them that we're not going to use a database. <laughs> The big issues, though, are really the analysis and people trying to apply CQRS and event sourcing where it really shouldn't be applied. That's the single biggest problem that people run into. Because going through and doing analysis to figure out your commands and your events is expensive. Uh, do you have any hints on uh, how, to, uh, how to know when to apply CQRS? Right here. <laughs> when you get a large, that's where you should be looking. It's basically, when we're talking about domain-driven design, I have found very few domain models that would not benefit from CQRS. I'd say you're probably looking at a 99% overlap. If you're looking at using DDD, then you're probably looking at using CQRS as well. You said how uh, CQRS is uh, reacting from because you don't have to do up this quick when you want to replay the class. Yep. How do you make sure that when you replay the class these events with you know new maintained with active code, you get the same results? But I may not want the same results. Mm -hmm. I may change my perception of things that have happened in the past. So you would get that one data to look back. Wow. Uh, my events are still going to all be, these are the events that actually occurred in the system, but I may take a new perspective on what they mean. And that's perfectly okay. Uh, we went through an example of that with our domain object, where suddenly we started caring about <coughs> things that uh, had been removed from carts. And I changed my structural model, and I actually ended up with a different result today. Um, part of the reason that we have the event is so that we can change these things over time. Um, a lot of people start, and they try to replay commands. And they get into a lot of trouble, and that's exactly the trouble that you're talking about now. Um, they also get really confused because uh, our behaviors change over time and if we're replaying the behaviors, but we're not replaying the behaviors. We're replaying the state transition. A perfect example of where you can run into a lot of problems with this. Uh, you can imagine that we've got a command that sells something to somebody. And as part of selling, we charge a credit card. So now every time we replay, we recharge your credit card? <laughs> this would be an unhappy customer. <laughs> When we replay, we don't replay the behavior or calculations. We only replay the state back into the object. So any calculations are going to be on that event. We don't recalculate them. We don't recharge people's credit cards when we reload. Because we have that event and we have that information denormalized down, it becomes very easy for us to do. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, maybe we are uh, um, a little bit too late, so we should have lunch now. Yep. I'm not quite sure. Uh, Greg is uh, here. Yeah, I'll be around all day. And uh, also at, at, at the after party. Yep. So maybe you can ask him your questions during lunch or the at the party. Thanks a lot, Greg. Thanks.